It really is an honor to be here, and I thank in a special way my new friend, Dr. James Orr, and my great friend, Yoram Hazoni, for inviting me. I will repay one of the compliments that Yoram very generously paid me. He's doing more to unite the right across continents and oceans than anyone in the world today. It's also altogether fitting and proper to organize this conference on national conservatism in England, where it was born so long ago, and where it won in the Brexit referendum of 2016 its greatest victory since the end of the Cold War. Like the election of Donald Trump in the United States that same year, Brexit lifted the hopes and expanded the horizons of a more nationalist conservatism across the West. Unfortunately, Tories here, like the Republican Party back home, failed to harness that momentum and translate it into a reimagined governing agenda. The lack of a clear, comprehensive policy program is always a challenge for a political coalition. For right-of-center political parties, the lack of that is a death wish. Because the other side does not have this problem, they have a vision and an agenda and a single-minded obsession with imposing on the world without the votes of legislatures or the consent of the governed. The new left, greedy, woke, elitist, and globalist, has forsworn every principle their ideological predecessors once espoused. Democracy, equality, diversity, justice. It abjures religion and Christianity especially, as well as the nation state, political accountability, and even objective truth. Their goal is not to win political contests, but to end them altogether, to sweep away dissent and any subversive institution that dares facilitate it. Today, in the context of leftist control of globalist corporations and entities like the United Nations and European Union, the nation itself has become the most subversive and dangerous institution of them all. National borders, identity, and sovereignty are seen not as beloved inheritances, but benighted obstacles, just so many Chesterton fences impeding the march of progress. Properly considered, then, this new left is not in competition with the right. It is at war with the West, with the moral, intellectual, and social foundations on which our entire civilization rests, which is why it reserves a singular hatred for the kind of conservatism represented by Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, by Brexit, by Viktor Orban, and yes, by this conference. The institution of the nation is the source and reservoir of the power globalists need to achieve their goals, and the one most resistant to elite capture. Unlike corporations, governments, and even churches, nations have no C-suites or HR departments to bully. They have cultures, loyalties, and loves prior to mere policy, and in these, the power, therefore, to defeat globalist ambitions. National conservatism is derided, and sometimes hailed, as something new, novel, unfamiliar. Its enemies call it frightening, and too many of its adherents fashion it edgy. You see, it's neither. The emergence of nationalism and populism on the right is a reemergence. It's a rebirth of the principles Western conservatives de-emphasized over the last three decades to their nation's peril and to global elites' advantage. Progressives prefer an establishment conservatism whose leaders secretly but desperately crave elite approbation, or even a blinkered libertarianism susceptible to the materialism that is the left's home turf. A conservatism of the nation, on the other hand, undergirded by individuals, families, and communities, spiritual bonds, and patriotism of place, cannot be tolerated because it cannot be bought. Contrary to false framing, conservatism since the Cold War has gone adrift, not because it went mainstream, but because it left the mainstream. 
Conservative parties detached themselves from the permanent things they were formed to conserve. Somewhere along the way, conservative leaders forgot that markets, globalization, individualism, GDP growth, and foreign alliances were means, not ends. The left suffers no such confusion. From their headquarters in Brussels, Washington, London, New York, Beijing, Silicon Valley, they understand all of the above as tools, indeed, even as weapons. As legions under their command arrayed in line of battle against the institutions and people who still defend family, faith, and flag. Facing this new gathering storm, conservatism cannot rely on the faulty navigation instruments that led the last generation of leaders into it. We must turn to older, truer, more authentic guides, starting with the first and greatest conservative, Edmund Burke. For a Burkean reevaluation of the last several decades can help conservatives in the UK, the US, and around the world identify yesterday's missteps and, more importantly, today's opportunities. Critics of national or populist conservatism on the right usually decry its departures from the agendas of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. And frankly, from this friend, some national conservatives mistakenly wear this shallow analysis as a badge of honor. In fact, it is national conservatism and not the corporatist, secular, neoliberal establishment that bears the standard of Thatcherism and Reaganism in the 21st century. We should not hide from this fact, but in fact celebrate it. Reaganism and Thatcherism supply side tax cuts, deregulation, freer trade, defense spending, and NATO leadership did indeed rescue stagflated Western economies and win the Cold War. National conservatives ought not gainsay these accomplishments. We share them. But you see, that victory, what one historian called the end of history, gave Western elites unprecedented political capital and flexibility to spend it, which they did on the following. The European Union, deindustrialization and outsourcing, Iraq and Afghanistan, the degradation of marriage and the nuclear family, the financial crisis and Great Recession, the rise of China and of corporate subservience to Beijing, the retreat from religious observance and heightening of racial and ethnic tensions, immigration crises on multiple continents, the addiction, pornography, and social isolation that's driving an unprecedented mental health crisis, the great awakening and normalization of anti-Western, anti-Christian, anti-democratic, cultural totalitarianism in Western newsrooms, classrooms, and bureaucracies. And then, of course, the COVID lockdown debacle. These are not distinct, discrete phenomena, but myriad symptoms of one, ruling class contempt of everyday working families and the institutions that prioritize their rights and interests over elite privilege. Things like democracy, the rule of law, free speech, religious devotion, marriage and family, ordered liberty, property rights, and yes, the real free market, real free market, as opposed to the altar of corporatism that big government globalists idolize. But more than anything else, the ruling class despises nationhood. That's why globalist elites in every nation rule so as to skirt accountability. Through treaties, ratified or not, international bodies, courts, and unelected bureaucracies, woke elites don't so much lead or govern Western nations as they occupy them. Their agenda chastises rather than represents their nation's views and reprograms rather than reflects their people's values. Thus did yesterday's fruitful one-nation conservatism beget today's sterile no-nation globalism. It doesn't matter that they might coincidentally share the nationalities of the people they would rule. 
just as it did not in 1790 when Edmund Burke wrote of French revolutionaries, these pretended citizens treat France exactly like a country of conquest. Acting as conquerors, they pursue the policy of barbarous victors who condemn a subdued people and insult their feelings to destroy all vestiges of the ancient country in religion, in polity, in laws, and in manners to confound all territorial limits. One would be hard-pressed to better describe the soft, secular, elitist totalitarianism of the EU, the UN, and the woke industrial complex today. They openly, proudly, and even violently attack people's natural human affinities, our families and our values, our language and faith, our history and heroes, our literature, even our humor, as illegitimate rivals to their authority. To globalist elites, Burke's little platoons are terrorist sleeper cells. To Burke, of course, they were the fundamental units of the commonweal, the love of which in every nation was the headwater of social solidarity, patriotism, and even international harmony. For it was Burke, the national conservative, who supported both Indian and American independence from London, while the city's most credentialed, moralizing elites profiteered off of imperialist obsession. It should come as no surprise that their successors in Europe's halls of power today passionately condemn Vladimir Putin's violation of Ukraine's national sovereignty, even as they coolly plot a far more aggressive and ambitious imperial project. All of this is, of course, frustrating to national conservatives. But more importantly, it's ridiculous. Temperamentally gloomy conservatives must not succumb to a desperate and false sense of elite's inevitable triumph. The haughty despotism assumed in elite institutions is less the stuff of Orwell's Big Brother than of Woodhouse's Roderick's Boat. Like a schoolyard bully or Instagram mean girl, globalist intimidating strength is influence, not authority. All the supposed power they wield in reality rests in the very nations they pretend to have transcended. However cowed their establishments and atrophied their demographic or democratic muscles, nations possess this power still. This is precisely what the Brexit vote, Trump's election, DeSantis's record in Florida, and Orban's enduring popularity show. And while why elite tantrums in Europe and back in America about them all were so spluttering and absurd. Their pretense as superior, external, independent overlords can be convincing sometimes, but they're ultimately just children playing dress up in their parents' clothes. Leaving the European Union and formally detaching itself from EU elite's masquerade ball was precisely the right thing for the United Kingdom to do. But as a great Tory once said, wars are not won by evacuations. The question since 2016 has not been whether the British people have the power to navigate the 21st century as an independent nation state. Clearly they do. Nor is the question whether global, corporate, political, and cultural elites will let them, because in the real world, they have almost no say in the matter. Rather, the question is whether the conservative party, like the Republican Party in the U.S., can follow through on their 2016 victories and build a new governing majority out of a new one-nation conservatism. I hope by now it goes without saying that the missing piece is not stylistic. Too many elected conservatives and Republicans treat nationalism and populism as costumes for partisan theatrics. On Twitter and on television, they rage about immigration and big tech censorship. But behind closed doors, they cling bitterly to their secular corporatist donor service platform. This is no more than what the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan called boo bait for bubbas, tough sounding rhetoric meant to placate populists and distract them from elitist policy. Woke elites 
on both sides of the Atlantic feign terror at this bumptious, grifting performance art. But it is not nationalism or populism. It's a parody of both that ultimately only empowers the establishment right and institutional woke left. The nationalism and populism that elites truly fear, the conservatism that the conservative party should embrace, is not insecure, furious, or divisive. It's confident, humble, thoughtful, cheerful, winsome, and most terrifying of all to the left, unifying. Call it one nation Burkeanism. The fundamental principles of one nation Burkeanism are very simply that the United Kingdom belongs to her people, period that her political, corporate, spiritual, and civic institutions should serve them, not the other way around, that her culture and history are a treasured patrimony British children have a God-given right to inherit, that those same children are a God-given gift British parents have a right to raise, that the religion of Britain's heroes and saints is true, that religious freedom is prior to governmental authority, and that Britain's success will be determined specifically by things economists and scientists cannot measure. The strength of our marriages, the happiness of our children, the flourishing of our communities, the dignity of our work, the vibrancy of our faith, and the restored confidence of every Briton that they are all in this together. The policy program that follows these principles should be as obvious to us in this moment, as Lady Thatcher and President Reagan's were in theirs. So far, however, whether owing to a failure of imagination or to a triumph of donor service, the One Nation Burkean policy agenda needed on both sides of the Atlantic remains, shall we say, a work in progress. Former Prime Minister Liz Truss's plan to cut taxes and regulation was attacked at the time, including by many national conservatives, for being inapt. The fairer critique is that it was incomplete. Coming out of COVID-19, a jolt of adrenaline to the UK economy's animal spirits was perfectly appropriate. What the plan lacked were complementary and long overdue reforms directly benefiting the working class conservatives of the heart that won the Brexit fight and the Tories their majority. Markets should, of course, generate wealth, and conservatives today should, as Burke did, profoundly endorse the restoration of truly free markets, disentangled from the rotten fruit cultivated by the corporatists and the bureaucrats. Conservatives need to remember that what we are railing against is not free markets and free exchange, but the crony corporatism perfected in places like Brussels and Washington, and yes, London. Our policy programs should be bold in this regard, reunifying the nation state as the free market and the interest of everyday people whose aspirations and work have always been the backbone of our movement. That is what tighter immigration laws, especially restrictions on lower skilled migrants, can do. That is what increased production and refinement of domestic energy can, can do and has done. That is what bilateral trade agreements, starting with the United States, can do. One Nation Burkeanism will produce higher wages as well as higher profits. It will focus on expanding ownership, not global supply chains, on the costs of family formation even more than global business formation, on lower rents, preferably through free enterprise, rather than only lower tax rates on incentivizing the investment of social capital, not just financial capital. And most of all, for the sake of our nation's futures, it must embrace making the economy as welcoming to those who choose to be one-income families in the 21st century as we did for two-income families in the 20th. Burke's little platoons, the family above all, are the most important asset in the portfolio of any nation that intends to remain free. Policy must treat them accordingly, 
not as unique and indispensable class of social, political, economic, and spiritual investment, not merely as a subcategory of consumer spending or brief for some new directorate general in Belgium. Policy can achieve these aims, and indeed only can in the context of the cooperative competition of an entrepreneurial economy. Abandoning free enterprise to help workers is like defunding police departments to help underprivileged neighborhoods or abandoning religion to free souls from the ravages of sin. One Nation Burkeanism should not seek to shelter workers and families from the storms of global capitalism, but make them the storm that sinks and splinters globalist institutions once and for all. The great irony of the EU is that it was created in part to end European elites' imperialist amb ambitions. But the fact is, it can still fulfill that destiny, just not in the way Brussels happens to think. Today, the EU embodies the cultural chauvinism, spiritual decadence, strategic incompetence, and tyrannical ambition that have hurried the continent into chaos for millennia. Its systematic assault on member nations' sovereignty, to say nothing of their diverse cultures, identities, and faith, is already tearing Europe apart and pushing it toward the brink. They think, because they rule by pen and microphone, they are kinder and gentler than their gauche martinet predecessors who led armies and navies. They're not. They're just as imperialistic, ambitious, megalomaniacal, and authoritarian as any of the bullies they hope to succeed. The only good news is that they're weaker than those who failed before them. You see, nations possess the power the EU and globalist elites never will. Just as in 1790, 1979, and countless dark hours in between, principled conservatism can answer this new moment. A one-nation Burkean conservative party, nationalist, populist, communitarian, and principled, can not only succeed where the post-Cold War left and establishment have failed, it can show the UK's sister nations across Europe how to follow its lead, how to reclaim their usurped rights, how to reunify their fractured nations, and revive their decadent cultures. But that work begins with us as we conclude this conference later today, committing that our work to rebuild our nations won't merely be focused on policy and politics. As important as those are, they are merely small parts of the larger issue. One Burke, were he here with us today, would remind us of, and one our good friend Yoram Hazoni phrases as leading a conservative life. So to my British friends, from this American friend, let me close by saying what nearly all Americans believe, but too infrequently say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for nurturing the culture and philosophy and worldview we inherited from you and now have the privilege of sharing custody of with you. Thank you for your heroism in battle every single time it mattered. And thank you somewhat preemptively for what I know you are capable of doing. Once again, rising to the occasion now to confront our shared challenges, to revitalize this great land to whom Americans and free people the world around owe immense gratitude. God bless you and God bless Britain.